Thomas Munster. Uh, it's, it's because of him and Melchior Hoffman, in a way, is the reason I decided to write this course. Because I've been known to know a little bit about Luther, Calvin, Zwingli, and uh, Men of Science and, and whatnot, uh, Thomas Cranmer. But some of the, the more obscure reformers who had a terrific impact in their time, I really didn't know that much about. You know, Zacharias or Science? Mm -hmm. I can't say I was an expert on, on him. I certainly wasn't an expert on Munster or on Melchior Hoffman. So one of the reasons I wrote this course is I wanted to become an expert on those people. So here's Thomas Munster. And I may in a few places uh, have missed the uh, 1489 born in Stolberg, Germany. He's ordained as a priest in 1513, so again, uh, a reformer who is operating within the church. Uh, May 1514, becomes a priest at St. Michael's in Rongschweil, which sounds sort of like a sausage. <laughs> 1516 to 17, he's the provost of the convent in Frosen. No doubt I'm pronouncing all these wrong. <laughs> 1518, he meets with Luther at Wittenberg, and at that point, uh, Luther kind of seems either a young man, he's interested in learning more about Luther's precepts, so of course Luther likes it at that point. Uh, June 27 to, June, uh, to July 3rd, 1519, he may have attended the John Eck and Andreas Karlstad debate in Leipzig. Eck is sent to uh, by the Catholic Church to debate with Karlstadt. On July 4th to July 14th, 1519, he may have attended the Luther Eck debate in Leipzig. And I should have made a separate list of things that are confusing about the Reformation. I'll point out a couple here. The Eck who was in these debates is not the same Eck who prosecuted Luther to counsel in verbs. There are actually two different Ecks, believe it or not. <laughs> and the other thing that's confusing is Thomas Munster is not the guy who led the Munster revolt, even though his name is Thomas Munster. That was actually Melchior Hoffman. So I'll try to mention these things as I go along, things that are confusing. I mean, wouldn't you assume that a guy named Thomas Munster, who was a revolutionary, would have been in charge of the Munster revolt? But that wasn't him. That was, that was Hoffman. Uh, where are we? 1519 to 20, Confessor to Cistercian nuns near Wiesenfeld. May 1520, he becomes a pastor in Zwickau, Saxony. April 521, expelled from Zwickau by the authorities for, among other reasons, rejecting infant baptism and he flees to Prague. One of the people who the Zwickau authorities have checked with about him was Luther, and Luther said he doesn't believe in infant baptism. Ah, and this is where Luther turns against him. But sometimes people associate Munster with being one of the first Anabaptists, and you notice know, this is very early. Uh, and one of the reasons is because of his rejection of infant baptism. November 1521, he writes an anti clerical Prague manifesto, again, uh, not making him popular with the <laughs> Parish priests uh, when they're meeting at the pub. Uh, 1523 to 24 founds the Allstead League, which accepts violence as a tool for reform. At the very on our first day of the three of the introduction, we talked about the continuums. One of the continuums was: Is violence okay to achieve your ends, or are or pacifism is the other end of that? Uh, Munster very much over the, the violence side. Uh, 1523, Pastor Alstead Turingia. I kind of always get a kick out of this. So the guy's forming this revolutionary organization. He's making these inflammatory statements from the pulpit. But he still has to live, and so he becomes the, uh, the pastor at Alstead Turingia. June 1523, marries a former nun named Ottilie von Gerson. And, uh, Luther, of course, will marry a former nun as uh, with some of the other reformers. Uh, December 1523 produces the first full German liturgy called the Order of German Church Service. Oh. Oddly enough, before Luther. 
Uh, July 1524, Luther attacks Munster and Karlstad in his letter to the princes. What the letter to the princes is, is a letter that he sends out to all the princes and the German uh, principalities. And he says, if either of these two guys show up in your province, uh, don't let them preach. Now, Munster, he met once, big deal. Karlstadt was his closest friend at one time. Karlstadt is the one that conferred Luther's doctorate on him. And this is how Luther treated him. <laughs> July 13, 1524, he delivers his sermon to the princes given to the Duke John of Saxony and the Prince Elector Frederick the Wise, which is a rather inflammatory uh, statement. It is not anti-prince, it is anti-church official, which is probably why Duke John of Saxony and Prince Elector Frederick the Wise were happy to listen to it. July 31st to August 1st, 1524, he's called before a tribunal in Weimar before Duke John of Saxony. Uh, John uh, bans further printing in Alston, and Munster has to flee to Mulhouse in Thuringia. So he's actually kicked out of the <laughs> uh, they've been printing uh, inflammatory tracts and ousted and uh, that pretty much stops. So really, up until this point, big deal. Why the heck is this guy even on the list? He just sounds like a troublemaker priest. Big deal. Now we finally get to the point of why he is on the list. In August 1524, he becomes a leader in the German Peasants' War. Uh, September 1524, he produces the 11 uh, Mulhausen Articles and calls for a dissolution of the city council in Mulhausen. Not surprisingly, a few days later, he is expelled from Mulhausen <laughs> by the city council. <laughs> October 1524, during a visit to Nuremberg, he publishes the Hoch Verer Shop Schutz Ready. Uh, in which he calls Luther mindless and also rejects original sins, making him even more uh, endeared to Luther. <laughs> and actually, uh, in, in Luther's uh, worldview, it was probably this was the greater sin than, than this. Luther was used to being all the names, big deal, he didn't care. But rejecting an original sin, that, that, that's different. November, December 1524, uh, visits to Griesen near Schaffhausen and also goes to Basel, Switzerland, where he gets to, you know, get a little of that Swiss Reformed kind of theology going on. Uh, 1525 returns to Wolhausen. Remember, this is the one that had kicked him out earlier. Uh, March 1525, the citizens of Wolhausen vote out the city council. And I love this. Create the eternal league of God to replace it. Isn't that cool? <laughs> I love it. We'll get into the city council and we'll create an eternal league of God to replace the council. Yeah, that's the ticket. I love it. <laughs> uh, with Munster and former priest Heinrich Pfeiffer at its head. So he goes back. The city council kicked him out. He goes back and gets the people on his side. Uh, May 15, 1525, and we will talk about this in more detail as we go along. At the Battle of Frankenhausen, Munster leads 8,000 peasants in the battle uh, against mercenaries under Philip I of Hesse and Duke George of Saxony. The peasants are decimated, and Munster is captured and tortured. But this would be one of those things I didn't know that one of the reformers led 8,000 troops in the battle at one point. I didn't know that. It's like, uh, uh, you know, you're over at a bar and uh, uh, you get into a trivia contest with somebody. Name the Protestant reformer that served as a galley slave. That will stump most people. <laughs> and here's another one you can use. That's on my test. <laughs> uh, May 27, 1525, he is decapitated after the Battle of Funkenhausen. Well, that's unfortunate for him. <laughs> uh, so that's really the end of his biography. <laughs> <laughs> a couple more things. 1850, the uh, co-author of communism, Friedrich Engels, writes the Peasant War in Germany, where he holds Thomas Munster up as the first communist. Uh, 1956, East Germans produce a film called Thomas and Munster, starring Wolfgang Stumpf in the title role, and it's very much 
a propaganda film. Uh, I'm not putting it on the same artistic level as uh, uh, the ones that were done uh, by the Bolsheviks, uh, but it's still a, a pretty impressive. 1987, the world's largest oil painting, 400 feet by 45 feet. So this is bigger than the cyclorama. <laughs> Think about that, 400 feet is a football field plus 100 feet. Uh, entitled Führer Bürgerliche Revolution in Deutschland or the Early Bourgeois Revolution in Germany. <laughs> I don't know how long it is. Isn't this great? Uh, the painting was done by Werner Tuke at the request of the East German government. And of course, back then, it wouldn't have been at the request. They would have ordered him to paint. And so he did, did things. And I, I, don't you wonder where is that today? Now, <laughs> this is somebody's living room. <laughs> <laughs> <A> very big <laughs> living room. Monster, how do we describe him? He's variously described as a mystic, a communist, a radical reformer, the founder of liberation theology, and occasionally is the founder of the Baptist. I think the last one's kind of weak, but I think the rest of this bottle of all. Now, he wasn't a communist in the sense that he was a member of the Communist Workers' Party of, of uh, the Ukraine in 1923 or something. Uh, but some of his views were, would lean that way. But he was definitely a mystic, he was definitely a radical reformer, uh, definitely had the idea of liberation theology. He's most associated with his role as a leader in the German Peasants' Revolt. Now, you recall one of the people who did everything he could to suppress the German Peasants' Revolt was Martin Luther. And I could find no paintings, I could find no engravings of Thomas Winston, uh, but I, there is a statue to him in Stolberg. Munster started out his career as a priest, soon gravitated to Lutherism. He may have actually met Luther, as we indicated in the biography. He rejected original sin, believed in continued revelation from heaven, and probably rejected infant baptism. Uh, so you can see where the mystical part comes from, this uh, continued revelation from heaven. This was a problem that the church had dealt with from the early days of the church. So you have this set of sacred writings written by the apostles, and people who knew the apostles. Well, what about people who say, well, I'm still receiving direct instruction from heaven, so shouldn't my writings be part of the New Testament also? Well, of course, that was all stamped out, like in the second century, and here we have somebody doing it in the 16th century. Strong views of achieving social justice. Uh, I put any means necessary in quotes because that would come from him, Next, but uh, that's where I got the liberation theology from uh, social justice. If you got to do it with arms, you, you do it. This is from his sermon to the princes in 1524. Now, if you're to be true rulers, you must seize the very roots of government following the command of Christ. Well, you'll be okay with that. The rulers are. Drive his enemies away from the elect. You are the instruments to do this. My friend, don't let us have any of these hackney doctrines about the power of God and truth of Christian without any result to your sword. Otherwise, it may rust in its scabbard. And the sword, too, is necessary to eliminate the godless. To ensure, however, that this now proceeds in a fair and orderly manner, our revered fathers and princes who with us confess Christ should carry it out. But if they do not carry it out, then the sword will be taken from them. For then they would confess him in words, but deny him in deeds. The tears have to be torn out of the vineyard of God at harvest time. And this was uh, directed against the hierarchy of the Catholic Church. March 1525, the urging of Munster, the citizenry of Mulhausen, voted out the city council and created the eternal League of God and replaced it. Shortly afterwards, just a couple months, Munster leads 8,000 peasants into a doomed battle against professional mercenaries at the Battle of Frankenhausen. The peasants are decimated after being betrayed, and Munster is captured, tortured, and eventually beheaded. Now there is actually an interesting moment uh, the, the mercenaries sent a message into the camp of Munster. 
And they basically said, turn Munster over to us, we'll let the rest of you go. So Munster reads the message, and because he's a fair guy, he calls a council. And they all get together and discuss, well, should we give up Munster and go home, or, or should we not? But basically, while we're having the council, the, uh, the mercenaries attack. It doesn't matter. Uh, this is from Frederick and Engel's book on uh, Thomas Munster. He says that uh, Munster assembled his forces at Franken thousand, eight thousand men and seven cannons. The men were poorly armed and badly disciplined. Well, so far, so good. They count a few ex soldiers among them and certainly lack leadership. <laughs> I love this. It appears that Winston possessed no military knowledge whatsoever. <laughs> That's my favorite quote in the uh, Engels book. <laughs> Munster stood with his people in the mountain, which is still called Mount Battle, Schlottberg, entrenched behind a barricade of wagons. The discouragement among the troops was rapidly increasing. The princes had promised them amnesty should they deliver Munster alive. Munster assembled his people in a circle to debate the prince's proposals. A night when the priest expressed themselves in favor of capitulation. Yeah, you go, Thomas. We're going to go home. Munster had them both brought inside the circle and decapitated. So, so much for that. I want all of you to speak freely, but if you disagree with me, I'm going to have them decapitated. <laughs> this act of terrorist energy, jubilantly met by the outspoken revolutionaries, caused a certain halt among the troops. Most of the men would have gone away without resistance had it not been noticed that the princes Lansquine, who had encircled the entire mountain, were approaching in close columns in spite of the armistice. What a shock. <laughs> they didn't go along with the turn of the armistice. A front was certainly formed behind the wagons, but already the cannonballs and guns were pounding the half defenseless peasants, unused to battle. And the Longs Quine reached the barricade. After a brief resistance, the line of the wagons was broken, the peasants' cannon captured, and the peasants dispersed. They fled in wild disorder and fell into the hands of the enveloping columns and the cavalry, who perpetrated an appalling massacre alone. Out of the 8,000 peasants, over 5,000 were slaughtered. The survivors arrived at Frunken House, and simultaneously with them, the prince's cavalry. The city was taken. Munster wounded in the head was discovered in a house and captured. On May 25th, uh, Mulhausen also surrendered. Munster was put on a rack in the presence of the princes and then decapitated. Frederick Ingalls, the peasant born in Germany in 1850. The, one of the interesting things about 25 and 24 is today we associate the Anabaptist movement with pacifism. Amish and Mennonites get an automatic deferment if they get drafted. Uh, they still may have to serve as medics, but not in combat. But back in the early days, there were definitely two different strains of Anabaptism. 